What is the secret to unlocking your full potential? What makes your idols any different than you? How do you become the person you've always wanted to be in life? This is where you get all of your questions answered. My name is Justin Shank, and I sit down with some of the most epic individuals who are changing the world with their actions in business and in life. We discuss how they did it, why they pushed themselves, and more importantly, how they were able to focus on continuous growth to achieve their dreams. Welcome to the Growth Now Movement. This week, I sit down with Gretchen Rubin. Gretchen is a five-time New York Times best-selling author. She's a podcaster, speaker, and creator of the Four Tendencies Framework, exploring happiness and good habits. Gretchen considers herself an explorer of human nature. She's a former lawyer who dove into the idea of what is happiness, and she really, really dove in. In this episode, we talk about why it became a focal point for her and then how it became her main focal point in many books after that, and obviously her podcast now, Happier. We dive into why Gretchen refuses to define what happiness is uh, and why exploring being happier is much better than just being happy. So what are the things you can do in your life to transform and shift your mindset and how you're looking at things in order to create a happier life? I think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode. Gretchen gives a ton of great nuggets along the way of how you are able to shift your life. She also talks about some cool moments in her life that she's been able to experience. And she answers that age old question of which is cooler to be interviewed by Oprah or to be a Jeopardy answer. Uh, I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun with this one and also a ton of takeaways. So if you're at home, make sure you write down some notes because there are a lot that you can implement into your life right now. But really quick, before we get into the episode, I wanted to discuss something with you. Over the last year, I've been able to more than 10x my business, 10x my relationships, and 10x my impact on this world. And now I'm helping other people do that. So if you are a successful entrepreneur who's looking to grow in all areas of your life, it is now time to join the Growth Now Mastermind. What you want to do is to go to growthnowmastermind.com, fill out the application. We're launching in September, but we're taking applications now. We are only accepting 10 to 15 high-performing entrepreneurs who are ready to 10x their business, 10x their relationships, and 10x their impact starting today. So if that's you, head over to growthnowmastermind.com, fill out an application, and I'll be in touch soon. Now, without further ado, let's get into the episode with Gretchen Rubin. Gretchen, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be talking to you. Yeah, this is going to be a great conversation. And, you know, we were kind of chatting briefly before I hit record and I was talking about how your work just makes sense. And I think, you know, obviously all the all the research you've done and, and the, the stuff you've put into the research to get it out on paper and then for it to kind of be so clear, I love. And so I don't want to get too much into your backstory. I just want to dive into content with you because there's just so much. Um, mm. Obviously, you're the master of happiness, in my opinion, right? And how to live <laughs> happier and obviously your podcast, Happier, and all the, all the amazing books you've written. So let's start with the idea of, to you, what is happiness? Well, you know, I never do define it. I started my career in law, and so I have happy memories of spending an entire semester arguing about the definition of contract. And happiness is an even more elusive uh, concept. There's something like 15 academic definitions of happiness. And I think for the average person, it actually just starts getting really tricky. Like, you know, people are like, no, it's peace, it's satisfaction, it's bliss, it's contentment, it's, you know, hedonic well being. And I think that, um, I think it's it's more helpful to think about like, well, will this make me happier? However, mm-hmm. I conceive of a happy life, will I be happier if I do this next month, next ne- year, you know, next year, rather than what is happiness? Because I think that kind of stumps you. But when you think about, well, would this make me happier? I feel like, at least for me, that's much easier to conceive. So I just skip the definition part <laughs> altogether. Yeah, and and I don't blame you for that because every conversation I have with people you know, I get those types of questions as well. Like, how did you become so happy? I'm like, well, I'm just living my life versus you have to live your own. So don't follow what I do, kind of have to figure out your own path. So would you say that you kind of came up with the idea of like, okay, I'm never defining this only because you were a lawyer or when you started to observe people, 
that kind of became clear. Well, I, there's a certain kind of person, and I think I just had a lot of uh, 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 exposure to this kind of personality because of law school, but it's something in the world where people just want to argue about definitions. And you can throw something out there and you can talk about, well, let's talk about meditation. And they're like, well, you say meditation's X. I say meditation's Y. <laughs> you're right. I'm wrong. You're, I'm wrong. You're right. I mean, and it's just like, well, we could just play this game all day because it's yeah. like, like, you can just, whatever I say, you're like, no, but my definition is different from your definition. And then it's like, and so some people find that enormously satisfying, apparently. Yeah. Um, and I just, I'm like, whatever, man. Like, if you want to call that meditation, you can call that meditation. I don't think it's meditation, but like, I don't want to get into it with you because it's like, that's not useful. Because if you have your own definition and that works for you, you're, why would you, why would you use my definition? And with happiness, people are always being like, well, I don't care about living a happy life. All I care about is living a life filled with purpose and engagement with other people. And I'm like, well, what do you think a happy life would be? They're like, well, that's not happiness. I'm like, well, what is ha then it's like, What is happiness? Then, <laughs> then they define it and you're like, no, I think that's blah. You know, I'm like, okay, this is just not moving the ball forward in my mind because what we're just arguing about is definitions instead of saying whatever it is that you want maybe you want something different from what i want but if we are sort of generally in the same area what would we do to achieve that mm -hmm. you say that you want a life filled with purpose i say i want a life of happiness for both of us would it make sense for us to get enough sleep probably we would say yes so we can all let's talk about that part of it or like let's build relationships we can both agree on that even if we sort of want to argue about these definitions yeah and and that's so spot on and so you started to kind of break down some things that you discovered kind of lead to that happiness or fulfillment in our life or whatever word we want to choose yeah, right exactly uh, the blank. just even even right there i was yeah like, right there you're <laughs> like or fulfillment it's like is happiness fulfillment maybe yes maybe no who can say let's look it up you're i'm right you're wrong Blah, yeah, blah. it's it's just like and and I'm the same way. Like I don't want to argue. It's like it's yeah. almost like the political battles, right? I don't want to talk about politics with you. You're going to believe what you believe. I'm going to believe what I believe and we can both be okay with that. But but when you started to discover these actions that you can take and these habits that you can form to create happiness, like was it a trial and error thing for you or was it like this makes me happy? I'm I think this is the one I'm going to put in the book or I think this is the one that I'm going to start telling the world. Well, with the uh, way back to the happiness project, which is all about sort of like, how can I make, can you make yourself happier? And if so, how could I do that? Um, I definitely, I did all this research about ancient philosophy and contemporary science and pop culture and whatever um, to come up with, well, what do I think the principles are? What seem to be the most important elements? And for me, as you said, before, you, you alluded to this earlier, everyone has to do it for themselves because certain people, we all have different values and different interests and different challenges. And so... Um, so I definitely chose the, and, and so I would, I gave myself 12 themes to match the 12 months of the year because it was a year long project. And so I picked things where I was like, this is an area where I, I think I could be happier, like work or friends. And, and then I picked con like a handful of concrete manageable resolutions that I thought would make me happier. So I tried to, I wasn't, you know, sometimes when people do things like this, these sort of self experiment myself as guinea pig they're like i'm gonna try the like craziest things you know aj jacobs is like i'm gonna do the most outlandish things and see what happens and he's sort of funny to see what he does i wasn't picking the things that were outlandish i was picking the things that i thought actually had the highest likelihood of being useful for me so mm -hmm. i kept it very very realistic um i mean i love aj jacobs and i love that kind of thing but um i i so i picked things where it really was like you know trying to start a group you know, which is like all the research would say, if you join or start a group, you are very likely to become happier. Um, and that's, that's not an outlandish thing. That's not something where people are like that, that crazy Gretchen Rubin, you know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> people start groups all the time. Um, yeah. So I, I kept it very uh, sort of close to home and, yeah. and with things that I thought would work, almost everything I did did work um, because I, I tried to pick wisely. No, for sure. And so just to kind of kind of break that down a little bit, obviously, you know, to form a group or obviously surround yourself with people and, and whatever the case may be. And you talk about these outlandish things. And I immediately thought about Tim Ferriss. And I was like, yes, well, exactly. And do the yeah. Tim Ferriss thing would be impossible for me. But if you kind of break it down and make it super simple, that makes right. more sense. Right. Right. So is that how you approach everything in your life? Well, you know, it is sort of funny. I am very systematic and I do love, like, I, I feel like I can't just like off and do something. I have to kind of institutionalize it in some way. Um, so if somebody said like, oh, well, whenever you feel like it, do X, Y, Z. I'm like, well, I, 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 am I doing it once a week? Am I doing it once a day? Like I have to have some kind of pattern for myself. 
So I think I do really uh, naturally have an affinity for that kind of very systematic, scheduled um, approach. Now, flash forward several years, and I wrote my book, Better Than Before, which was all about how people make and break habits. And in the course of researching Better Than Before and trying to understand what challenge, why certain people had cer- certain very predictable patterns of challenges in their habit formation, I stumbled across my four tendencies framework, which divides people into four categories, upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And what I learned about myself, which, you know, looking back now sheds all this light on my previous work, is that I'm the kind of person, I'm an upholder, which means that I readily meet outer and inner expectations, which means that I really like to-do lists, and I really like calendars, and I really like schedules, and I really like habits, and I, li- I like routines, and I like, I would love to have the life of a Benedictine monk. That would be my fantasy. Whereas yeah. like someone like a rebel, they would not like that. They don't want to feel trapped by a schedule. They want to be spontaneous. Um, and any, anybody who wants to take this quiz, if you go to quiz.gretchenrubin.com, you can find out your tendency. Um, but, um, but so I think that I had, a, I had an unusually high appetite for doing things in that way. I think a lot of people can do it, but they don't do it kind of to the degree that I would do it because mm. for them it might feel overwhelming. Whereas for me, it felt super fun. Yeah. Now, do you think that you have to be a certain way to create this life of happiness? Like, is, do you have to be a certain type of person or you, can you be anybody and then kind of formulate that around who you are? Well, um, you mean, could you make yourself happier? Is that the yeah, question? So, so meaning uh, like, you you know, you're very systematic and you like schedules uh, and routines. Can I? Oh, yeah. Do- no, I don't think everybody would do it my way. No. Okay. No. So, no. so what, is that, what does that look like for somebody? So if I have a listener listening right now and they go, well, I'm not systematic. I'm not totally organized. I don't like systems. What's, what are things they can do right now to kind of create that life that they want? Well, then they're probably a rebel. That sounds like a rebel. So a rebel is somebody who resists outer and inner expectations alike. So they want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. And they can do anything they want to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And they they typically don't like to tell themselves what to do. So they don't sign up for a 10 a.m. spin class on Saturday because they don't like the idea of like, I don't know what I want to do on Saturday. And if they try to do something like make rules for themselves, like I'm going to give up sugar, they often the next day will find themselves like eating a giant bar of chocolate because they're like, I'm going to resist the rules that someone's trying to impose on me, even if that's me. The, the, The rebel motto is you can't make me and neither can I. Um, yeah. so if, so if a person was, and I go into this in, you know, in incredible detail in the four tendencies book, because, um, because rebels are often like, I want to, I do want to do the things that I know would make me happier, but the minute I try to systematize them or make rules for myself, I resist them. So what do I do? So what rebels can do is they can tap into their identity, um, because identity is a huge value for rebels. So you're not exercising because you're supposed to, you're not exercising because your doctor tells you to, you're not exercising because your sweetheart is telling you to, you're an athlete. You've always been an athlete or maybe you have a strong vital body. You're very connected to your body. Like you want to get out there and move. You want to be healthy. You don't want to be trapped by a bad knee or a bad back. You don't want to feel uncomfortable uh, traveling because you're not in good shape. You don't want to feel like you you have fewer options because you're not in good shape. And by the way, you love being outside. You love having the wind in your face and you're going to exercise in the middle of the workday. They're trying to keep you trapped behind the screen, but they can't because you're going to go for a bike ride during lunch. That kind of thing works for a rebel because it's who am I? What do I want? Is my identity. Mm. Um, the other thing for rebels is they often do, do like a lot of choice and spontaneity. And so when I've talked to rebels about something like exercise, like, well, for someone like me, like I just went to my high intensity weight training today, 10 a.m. once a week. I go, I work out with Mike and we do high intensity weight training. And I, like, it's exactly the same every time. And I love that. That might not work for a rebel, but what a rebel can do, what they often do, they'll join a big gym that has tons of classes, tons of options. Like, you know, you could do cardio, you can do weights, you could whatever. And then they just go when they feel like it and they do whatever they feel like. They're like, oh, I heard about this cool Zumba class. Like, I want to check that out. I'll go today. What am I going to do tomorrow? I don't know. Maybe I'll do yoga tomorrow. Just wait. Or, or like maybe a lot of times um, they will use an app that like can find you classes all over town or they'll keep like all their stuff in their car so they can just like whenever they feel like it, they can go. Um, uh, often rebels are attracted to things that are very challenging or surprising. So they might, you know, like train for an Ironman or like I remember talking to a woman who was a female bodybuilder and she said, I love blowing people's minds because I'm very petite, kind of cute. And when they see what I can lift, like I blow their minds, you know? Mm. And so, so rebel, everybody can find their way to 
a happier life. But I think that it's true that we all have to think about ourselves and just we, trying to cram yourself into someone else's model or thinking, well, if it works for them, it should work for me or feeling bad because something works for someone else and it doesn't work for me. It's like, well, there's nothing wrong with you. It's like, okay, that didn't work. Like there's a million other things to try. Right. Um, so I think a big part of it is matching um, a person to a particular approach to get to a, to wherever it is that you want to go rather than saying the most efficient way to work out is to go for a run first thing be, before as you wake up before you go to work and so what you should do is get up at 7 a.m every day and go for a three mile run it's like well what if you're a night person right what if you're very sensitive to cold what if you hate running what if you have a bad knee what if you have a little kid it's like okay there's just like a million things wrong with that advice it's fine on paper it's not bad advice but it's like it's not particularly good advice for any p specific person. Yeah, that's interesting. So when I look at the trajectory of your life and, and how you kind of got into this, what was the tipping point? Like, why did you even start doing the research in order to write this book? Like, what was it about this idea of happiness? And then obviously has led to other books, which kind of right. all culminate into the same thing. And the, your most recent one talking about decluttering your life. Yeah. We can talk about that too. But what, what was it? Was there a tipping point for you to be like, I need to f figure this out? Um, well, I had been writing for a long time, and uh, at that point, I was just finishing my book, uh, 40 Ways to Look at JFK. And there's a period in a writer's life where a book is like, I was done with the book, but it wasn't out yet. And so it, that's kind of a tricky time because you sort of can't get into your next project. Um, and so I had, I would say, more mental space than I often do when I'm like just sort of thinking constantly about whatever it is that I'm writing a book about. Um, and so I was stuck on a, on a city bus in the pouring rain. And I looked out the window and I thought, well, you know, just kind of asking myself a rhetorical question, which I have to say, I do that kind of thing all the time. <laughs> you know, what is it that I want from life anyway? And I thought, well, I want to be happy. But I realized I didn't spend any time thinking about whether I was happy or how I could be happier. And um, I thought, well, I should have a happiness project. And I thought of that word and I went out the next day and got a giant stack of books from the library and started reading like, what is happiness? Even though now I would refuse to define it. I wanted to know, you know, what do people define as happiness? Can you make yourself happier? Is that something that's even possible? If you could make yourself happier, what are the kinds of things that you would do? What is contemporary science saying? What are the ancient philosophers saying? Like, what is the kind of popular advice that we're all sort of exposed to? What do you see in memoirs and biographies? And so at first it was just for me. I wanted to do a happiness project in my own life. And part of it was I was pretty happy already. And I, and I knew that I didn't appreciate it enough. So a big aim of my happiness project was to awaken myself to how, 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 much, how many of the elements of a happy life I already had and, and not take them for granted. Um, and so mm -hmm. I was not starting from a place of deep unhappiness or despair at all. I was pretty happy already. Um, but I thought, well, I, th I bet I could be happier. And indeed, that's what I found. I think for, for just about everybody, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. There's things that we can do. Um, but once I got into it and started like seeing all the things that I wanted to learn more about and that I wanted to try, uh, an experiment with in my own life, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger until, until finally I was like, oh my gosh, maybe this is my next book because this just seems so limitless. And indeed I've kind of been in that zone ever since. I, I kind of will go deeper into different parts. Of my, my, from the very beginning, my, my subject has been human nature. Yeah. That's what I always write about. But now I'm kind of more in the happiness zone. Um, yeah. Do you ever, out of curiosity, do you ever feel stressed like being the happiness person like when you're not having a good day? Does that ever happen where you're just like, ugh? Oh, I feel no I... pressure to feel happy. No, no. I don't <laughs> feel like, no. So no, I don't. I don't even think being happy all the time would be a good life. Really? So you no. feel like you need the ebbs and flows in order to... I don't feel like I need them, but I feel like it's part of life. Like, am I going to feel happy if like a friend is in the hospital? No. Like, do I yeah. do... I, I don't, but I don't, I don't wish that away. No, for uh, sure. That's yeah. an inter That's a super interesting take. And then obviously since then you've kind of, you've, like you said, you've kind of gone deeper on certain things and the most recent yeah. was like the decluttering your life. Yeah. Where did that whole idea come from for you as far as like, okay, there, there's a whole book on this one topic that I can dive into. Well, it's funny because I know it seems funny um, because, you know, for years I've been talking to people about, OK, you know, if you want to be happier, however you conceive of that, you know, do this, do that, do that. And, you know, people love talking about all the different things. And, 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 and I love talking about all the different things. But I noticed over time that whenever something related to decluttering or organizing came up, there was sort of a special energy around it. Like people seemed to find it funnier. There was kind of a buzz, like even something like, do you make your bed? Like if I would ask an audience that people would laugh and they would kind of talk amongst themselves. And I was like, what? And, and, and also I have all these secrets of adulthood, which are like these 
summaries of what I've learned with time and experience. And one of, one of the secrets of adulthood is, for most people, outer order contributes to inner calm. And the fact is, people repeated that back to me all the time. They'd say, oh, this is what you say, and that's so true for me. Outer order contributes to inner calm. And I realized, like, this is really resonating with people more, more than you would think it should, because we can all agree that in the context of a happy, healthy, productive, creative life, something like a crowded coat closet or an overflowing in-basket is inconsequential, clearly. And yet over and over, people would be like, I feel amazing. You know, or like, <laughs> I cleaned up my utility closet and I was like walking past it for two weeks just because it gave me so much happiness just to see it all cleared out. I'm like, what's going on here? Because this is really disproportionate. It doesn't really make sense. And yet we can harness that um, mm -hmm. to make ourselves, like give ourselves that jolt. And so and like, I'm constantly begging my friends to let me come over and clear their clutter. And so I just, I, I love thinking over? about it. Yeah, I love thinking about it myself. I love doing it myself. I get such a charge out of it myself that it, it just seemed like it would be a really fun book to write about, a really fun subject to think about and, and, and something to really focus in on my own life. And absolutely, um, it really has proved to be true. Yeah, it's almost like an endorphin boost. So like I just, it is. I, yeah, I was saying before this, I, I just had a live event. So building up to the live event, all these boxes were getting yeah. shipped to my place. Oh, yeah. And I was, they were just piling up and I couldn't do anything with it. Yeah. Them. And I was like, oh my, it would just create stress and anxiety. And I yeah. was like, I don't want this here. And finally, once the event happened, I, I had so much joy just unloading them I into know. my car. Like, yeah. The best. So it's, it's really weird how that is, that stands true. And yet yeah. there's all these people that live in this cluttered world, whether it's I have too much crap in my closet to my car is a mess to this, this yeah. place I got papers stacked up, whatever. Um, but it's just that simple. And so th the fact that you were able to create an entire book of information based off of that, like that's amazing. And, and I haven't read that book yet, but like, so what are some of the premises that you talk about in that book that people can start to put in their life today? Well, that book is meant to be a psych up book. So what it is, it's like, it has like brief parts that kind of go into like, well, why do we feel this connection? And, and what would you do to kind of create more outer order? But for the most part, it's just these very simple, straightforward ideas about how to approach clutter. Because I've, I was, I've always been enchanted by a book by Michael Pollan called Food Rules, which is like the same thing about eating. And I really love this kind of, these bite-sized, very accessible kind of flashes of information. Um, and I thought, well, it's very in keeping with the subject because I don't want a book that's like a heavy tome to read about clearing clutter. Like this is something that it's like a psych up book. You're going to read this. You're going to get ideas. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, I really want to plan a virtual move. I'm just going to imagine that I'm moving and go through and get rid of everything that if I were moving today, I would not pay, pay to move it. Or I'm going to go through and I'm going to follow the one minute rule. Anything I can do in less than a minute, I'm going to do without delay. Uh, hang up the coat instead of throwing it on the chair, you know, putting, printing out the paper and putting it in the file instead of just like leaving it on the top of my desk. It's, and all these things, it's like some work for some people and some, some work better for others. So this is just like a smorgasbord for you to choose. And um, there's more than 150 kind of little things. Like one is uh, that I just used today actually is to consider, I, I mean, is um, three strikes you're out, which means if it's occurred to you three times that maybe you should get rid of something, just go ahead and get rid of it. You know, give it away, throw it away, whatever. Because if you're actually using something and, and enjoying something, um, you're not like I use this. Uh, well, here I, I'm holding up a paperweight, which is like if you're typing from a book, you use this paperweight to hold the pages open. Yeah. Not everybody would use something like this every day. I use this thing constantly. <laughs> so it doesn't cross my mind. Should I give this thing away? Because no, I want to use this thing. But I had a pair of shoes, which like 10 times I thought, you know, I don't really wear those shoes and they're definitely past their prime. Should I get rid of those shoes? It's like, yes, because three strikes you're out. I'm way past that point. Yeah. Um, somebody told me that he was using the book as a random tip generator and every day he would just open to a random page and do whatever it said. I thought that was, I didn't think of that when I was writing the book, but I thought that was a really funny way to use it. That's a, that's a great way to use it. Yeah. And, and it kind of gamifies it. Yeah. That's almost like the rebel would use it that way, right? Yes. Cause it's spontaneous. <laughs> it's fun. If you don't like it, oh, you open to this page and you don't like it, just do it again until yeah. you get one you like. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, and I love all of that stuff. And, and, and again, going back to like the satisfaction of clearing things out, like yeah. hold on to that feeling and then continue yeah. to do it. Um, and you know, you, you look at the show, I don't even know why this popped in my head, but you look at the show like hoarders. I'm like, yeah. yo, just read Gretchen's book. 
Like, and right. just do it. Like, well, we'll do I will that. say about hoarders, hoarders is uh, people who hoard. That's really a mental illness. Yeah. So I think there's like pack rats that we all like some people really just are pack rats. And then you get to people who are hoarding and hoarding is really something different from your ordinary pack rat. So I would not say that my book would help people who are hoarders. Yeah. Uh, Cause that's a different kind of, you need a different kind of approach for that. If you're a pack rat though, if you're like, uh, my wife has kept everything for the last 30 years. It's like, okay, I have some ideas for that. <laughs> um, because, you know, because that can happen very easily. You know, if you just hang on to stuff, you're set a little bit of sentimental, you got a lot of room in your house and it's easier to just like dump something in the guest bed, um, bedroom closet than to figure out what to do with it. Like you can accumulate a lot of stuff and that I can help you with. Yeah. It, it certainly builds up. I'm not a sentimental person as far as stuff. So like the physical stuff, I've got like nothing that like are like past life things. So it's kind of interesting to think about like pack rats and like they hold on to it forever and they collect things and so on and so forth. But you've kind of recent, not too recently, but recently transitioned into, into podcasting. And obviously as a podcaster, I'm always curious as to why other people get into the genre, right? And so like, obviously you're a writer. And that's what you've done for so long. And we were talking earlier about how a publishing com- company wants me to write a book and I keep putting it off because I'm not a writer and so on and so forth. What was the transition into doing Happier the podcast? Um, why did you do it? Like, and then what have you seen since then within your brand and your business? Mm. Well, uh, Panoply, which was then uh, in the content business, uh, approached me and said, you know, would you be interested in a podcast? And if so, um, do you have an idea for a co-host? Because they, their, their belief, uh, their editorial belief was that co- the, like, it was easy, it was easier to make a good show with two people. Sure. Well, my sister Elizabeth, who she's a, like a fabulous, fancy TV writer in Hollywood and showrunner, all that stuff. For years, we'd been saying to ourselves, "We should have a radio show," because like we're just like our own brilliant thoughts. And so, the minute this was proposed to me, I was like, "Yes, I would like to do a podcast." And I ha- I know exactly who I would do it with. I would co-host it with my sister. And um, and the lovely thing is, um, uh, because be, because I truly I get along better with it. You, you, I have less conflict with anyone in my life than my sister, and we we're very compatible. And so, I mean, it made it very easy to kind of set up. Like, well, who's doing what? Can we have an open conversation about the, you know, a lot of times when you have a team, it's like, it can get very dicey about um, responsibilities and there can be a lot of like, like, like sort of like background stuff, which with my sister, just given the nature of our relationship, all that, we could just deal with all that in a very straightforward way. So that made it very easy. The subject happier like this is just something that I feel like I could never grow tired of talking about it. I would never run out. Like my mother was saying to us, aren't you going to run out of stuff? I'm like, literally, I I don't think we would ever run out. I I just don't think you could. I think it's just, it's just so limitless. Mm -hmm. So it's a great subject. And, um, and the thing about podcasting is, you know, it's a very writerly medium because it is all with words and it's all about like thoughtful words, because if you're just like blathering on, no one's going to listen to you. And so it has to be, it has to either be full of fascinating information or it has to be really funny or it has to be a, like an interesting story or it has to have words that will command people's attention. So it's a very writerly medium, even though it is spoken. Yeah. Um, so I think for Elizabeth, for both, um, both of us, it came very naturally. And yet, because we are, we are usually writers who are writing on a page, it was very freeing and exciting and fun for us to be in a place where we weren't like I'm used to, both of us are used to like writing an incredibly disciplined, every word is looked at over and over and over again. So it's kind of fun to be like, okay, now we're going to talk about X, Y, Z and kind of we, and what we do is we'll sort of say, we'll, we'll, we'll have a skeleton idea of what we're going to talk about, but we're certainly being spontaneous um, with what we're saying. You know, many, many podcasts are like the whole things are scripted. A lot of times the audience isn't aware of how scripted they are. Ours is not scripted in that way. Um, but so we, we were both very drawn to it because it was a writerly thing and yet and, and a word and a word thing and we're both writerly word people. Um, but it, it felt free. And of course, Elizabeth, because she works in a visual medium, it was kind of exciting not to have to worry about the visual. You know, she could just, uh, you know, didn't have to think about that element of, thing, you know, making something interesting visually. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, um, so it just was like a great fit of content because I felt like I just had so much content. Um, and it's funny because one of my words, every year I pick a one word theme for the year. 
And one of my words was repurpose. And one of the great things about the podcast is there's a lot of times there's something that I'm really, really interested in. And I wrote about it, you know, 10 years ago, I'm still really interested in it. And now I get to talk about it again. You know, I don't, I don't have to fit it into a new book that might be about a completely different subject, but it can work into the happier with Gretchen Rubin podcast. That's awesome. So when, yeah. when you talk about happier, you know, I, I, w- I just actually, I was the keynote for a statewide young professionals event in Montana uh, just last weekend. And I had, I was doing a Q and a, and I said something to somebody about how, you know, I live under the premise of always be happy, but never satisfied. But then there was a follow-up question with somebody of, well, if you're not satisfied, are you truly happy? Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. Like I, and so we, it goes back to like the words and how do we define yeah. things and all that stuff. And I was like, look, to me, like satisfaction is contentment and contentment is death to me. Like, I don't ever want to be completely. See, there we go. Right. right. Like and you're so, saying contentment's bad. Somebody else says contentment's good. Let's argue about that for half an hour. No, okay. right. Exactly. You know? exactly. There we go. So the, the point of me telling you all this is yeah. that, you know, is there ever an end to looking for happier? Do you think for you or anybody else? Um, well, it's funny because people are often like, well, don't you think that the search for happiness makes people unhappy because they get really stressed out about the fact that they're not happy or they could be happier. I'm like, I don't see that in the world myself. Like, I don't think that a lot of people are walking around like that. I don't, I, I feel like that's kind of a made up problem. I feel like the bigger problem is that people don't even think about it at all, which was certainly where I was coming from. People are busy. They've got a lot on their minds. They're just do. they're just sort of managing their day to day and they don't step back and say like, well, are there things that I could do, realistic, concrete things that I could do to be happier? And what would those be? So on the one hand, I would say I, I do think that it's healthy and, and helpful to constantly be saying, you know, I really have fallen out of touch with my friends. And what could I do to change that? Or, you know what? I used to play so much music in high school and college. And like, I've really drifted apart away from that. But I feel like if that came back into my life now, that could be cool. It's like, it does take a little bit of work and maybe a little bit of dissatisfaction to step back and to sort of recognize those opportunities. But I don't think it's like something that casts a dark shadow over your life. And I certainly think it's part of like what we should all do as part of kind of the tasks of adulthood. You know, we want to, on the one hand, we want to accept ourselves. And on the other hand, we want to expect more from ourselves. And so I think that that's just one of these constant tensions within happiness, which is, can I, can I feel happy with what I have? And yet still be saying like, yeah. And then life changes too. It's like, okay, you, you did some things and now you have a new baby and now you've got to rethink a lot of things in your life. And then, and now you have a, a teenager. Now you're rethinking a lot of things in your life. Okay. Now you've got an empty nest. Now you got to rethink a lot of things in your life. So life isn't static, you know, so yeah. we can't just sort of like fix something and then it just stays, stays the same. It's kind of constantly reevaluating or I'm in a new city. So now I have a whole bunch of new challenges. Um, I started a new job. Like how's this going to play out with all the things that I usually have been doing? How do I adapt to this, my new cir- circumstance? Maybe I have more money. Maybe I have less money. Um, you know, maybe I've had a, you know, I've had a certain like an epiphany that I want to travel the world for a year. It's like, you know, um, so I think that both things have to be true, that you have to be able to be like grateful for the happiness that you already have, but then also on the lookout for kind of concrete manageable ways to, you know, take it up a notch. Yeah. And I love your take on things. And maybe it's the lawyer in you of how you look at things yeah. and start to start to, start yeah. to dissect and look into them to say, hey, look, like I wanted to be happier and I wasn't paying attention to happier. Yeah. Focusing yeah. on the, all the other things. And right. And yeah. so like when you talk about like, oh, I just got a new job. So I'm stressed about the new job instead of going, well, how can I make myself happier? with this yeah. new job in scenario. So I like just like yeah. the, the changing of perspective uh, completely shifts everything and, and how you're thinking. So the cool part about this podcast is I get to interview some incredibly successful people. Again, that definition of what is success. Yeah, so, that also we, very complex, right? We people all argue define about that. Exactly, yeah. we all define it differently. But so my question for you is, and I ask everybody this, but what's your definition of success? And then what are three things you do every single day to ensure that success for yourself? Uh, my my definition of success is am I am, am I working toward my aims for myself? So as I'm working toward those, that's how I feel successful. Um, I make sure that I get enough sleep because um, I'm a sleep zealot. Um, I make sure that I have uh, lots of time for reading and writing. Um, reading and writing, they are my my playground in my cubicle, my, you know, my tree house and my, uh, and my treasure map, you know, so I, I just have to make time to, to read and to write. 
every day. Um, so, you know, if I'm on vacation, if I'm, if it's Christmas, if it's my birthday, you know, um, it's a very, very, very unusual day where I'm not doing some reading and writing or both. Yeah. And then, um, I just make sure that I am engaged with the people around me. And that's different depending on different days. Cause like maybe it's a day when I'm seeing friends and maybe it's a day when I'm like connecting with the people that I work with. And maybe it's a day when I'm connecting more deeply with my family. But um, that's something that I just, you know, make sure that every day is like got that element in it. Yeah. I love, I love all of those things. So I have to ask, you've done some incredible things with your career and these books that you've written. So what's cooler being interviewed by Oprah or mm. being a Jeopardy answer or question? Oh. Does work? <laughs> well, you know, they're both cool in, both, in, in two ways. One is the Jeopardy thing just happened. And I like, I had no idea that it was coming and it was like yeah. this big surprise and it required nothing from me. So that's kind of like, woo, that's just cool and easy and fun <laughs> and like flash. The Oprah thing, of course, I had to like, what am I going to wear? And like my sister came with me and we had to make plans. And then it's like, what is it going to be? And then it was like this out of body experience. And you know, it was like, it was a whole thing. So it's sort of both versions of like super cool. One, the easy fun thing that just comes and goes and requires nothing of you. And then one that was like a whole adventure that lasted, you know, for me, for a long time. Um, both kind of an apple and an orange, but both wonderful. Which I love. So I, I was just curious because I like when you read your bio, they're both in there. And I was like, yeah. clearly these are very big moments, which I would love to do either or both or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always wondered, yeah. like, how would you feel? But I, I like the fact that you said you had that out of body moment when you're being interviewed by Oprah. Because I imagine no. like it was probably over and you're like, what just happened? No, well, it's funny that you say that because that's exactly what happened because usually I have a very good recall for like conversations and things. And like, I got out of there. I'm like, I literally cannot remember one thing. I think I was concentrating so hard that like my short term memory, like didn't kick in somehow. Like, I can't remember a single thing. And then when I listened to it later, I was like, oh, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. Like, I remembered it all happening. It was like, I couldn't conjure, you know, if you just like have coffee with somebody, you can be like, oh, we talked about this. Then we talked about that. Then we talked about this other thing. I'm like, I have no idea what we talked about. Like, did I even make sense? Was I speaking English? Like, what was yeah. going on? Yeah. Um, because I was just fo so focused on, you know, what was happening. Um, but uh, but it was really cool because, like, I, you know, they say, like, well, you cannot bring an entourage with you. And I was like, but my sister's driving me from L.A. Like, could she just come? And they're like, oh, if it's your sister, sure, she can come. So, like, my sister, as I said, I'm very, very close to my sister, Elizabeth. Um, so she was, like, you know, 30 feet away. Yeah, and like went did the whole thing with me, which made it like a like a really kind of fun, whimsical adventure, as well as just being like this super serious kind of my, milestone in my life. Um, so that's a very very happy memory for a lot of reasons. And, and Oprah was exactly exactly the way you think. You know, when you meet famous so people, she gave like, you a car. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> she did not do that. She did not do that. But she was just very, um, she was just very much herself. So um, it wasn't one of those things where. Um, you know, like they say with David Letterman that like when he's not on camera, he's like very, very inward focused and yeah. kind of like just doesn't talk or anything. Um, no, yeah, Oprah was exactly as I expected her to be. So that was, that's cool. awesome. Cool. That yeah. That's always good to hear because I've met people because of the podcast that I'm like, oh my gosh, they're this way. And they're just somebody completely different. You're like, well, that was a little bit of a disappointment. So it's always good to yeah. you know, experience those types of things. And obviously she she herself has an incredible story and, and how she's been able to build that. So it's good to hear that she still is herself, which is always a good thing. So what I do at the end of all these interviews is I do five rapid fire questions, but before okay. we get there, how do people get a hold of you? Where do they go to listen to your podcast? What is all the good stuff in your life right now? Okay. Uh, you can find me and more information about happiness, good habits, the four tendencies than you could ever read. Um, if you go to my website, which is GretchenRubin.com, if you want to take the four tendencies quiz, you can go straight to quiz.gretchenrubin.com or you can search quiz for tendencies, whatever. Two million people have taken that quiz. So uh, wow. it's a big quiz. Um, people can listen to my podcast wherever they listen to their podcast. It's Happier with Gretchen Rubin. And again, I do that with my sister, who's my co-host, Elizabeth Kraft. Um, and I'm all over social media under my name, Gretchen Rubin. And I love to connect with people by email, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I have stuff on YouTube um, just under my name. So people can hit me up however they want. And I have tons of resources too, like discussion guides and one pagers and awesome. audio clips. If you want to like check, see, Oh, do I want to read an audio clip or I want to read a chapter of the book and see if it's right for me. There's like all sorts of stuff there about my books, about the podcast, everything. 
Awesome. I love all of that. And guys, it's not hard to find your podcast at all. It just open up iTunes and it's there. Uh, you guys are crushing it right now, which is always uh, good to see in the podcast space. So congratulations uh, on the success. Aren't you nice to say so? Thank you. No, for sure. For sure. So we're going to get into the five rapid fire questions. Some are fun, some are serious, but I ask okay. you this answer within one word or the most one sentence. Are you ready? Ooh, okay. All right. So the first one is if you could time travel to any time in the history of this world, where would you travel to? Victorian England. Mm, love that. What is one trait in a friend that is non-negotiable? Kindness. If you could have dinner with one person living or dead, who would it be? Flannery O'Connor. No, Winston Churchill. Nice. At the end of your life, if you could only be remembered for one sentence, what would that sentence be? No, oh, I can't tell. Skip it. <laughs> We're skipping that one? Yeah, I'm We're skipping just that one. Skipping yeah. it. Gotcha. So obviously this podcast is called the Growth Now Movement. So I wrap up every single episode with this one question, and that is in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? Maybe it's when I got the idea for my first book, which was called Power, Money, Fame, Sex, A User's Guide. Because when I had the idea for that, it, I was instantly so preoccupied with power, money, fame, sex, and doing the research for that. And doing the research for that showed me that that could be, I could write a book about that. And that turned me into a writer. Wow. I love all that. Gretchen, thank you so much for sitting down and having this conversation. This has been absolutely wonderful. Guys, make sure you go check out her podcast. It is amazing. Buy Uh her books, read them. I'm sure you'll love them. But Gretchen, yes, thank you so much for being you and doing what you do. Oh, well, thanks so much. It was so fun to talk to you. I so appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Growth Now movement. This is how you can really help me out. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And let's grow this movement to epic heights. And it's all going to be because of you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week.